Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week I have got a little bit of machine work that I want to share with you. I'm not exactly for sure how I'm going to pull off what I need to do uh, just yet, but I'm going to try. I've also got an update on the Brown and Sharp 618 MicroMaster surface grinder that I picked up at auction uh, a few weeks back. Just a small update, but an update nonetheless. I've also got another project that we're potentially going to get started on. You'll see there is a lot to do. So thanks for watching and let's get started. Oh, goodness, that is a heavy chunk of cast iron. So this is one of the front brake rotors off of my wife's 1986 Chevy Crew Cab Dually uh, that she named Johnny Cash. Uh, I'm in the process of getting this thing mechanically sound for her, kind of going over it. This is one of the front brake rotors, and both of them need re they need resurfacing because they're just... This thing's set since 2003. At least it's been off the road legally for 20 years. So they're a little rusty to say the least. So we're going to resurface this. I want to show you the tool that I think that will work good. We're going to grind it together. High speed steel. Uh, we'll turn this thing. Just freshen it up a bit. Just going to lightly dust it and then move on to something else. But that's a heck of a rotor. I'd rather resurface it than have to buy a new one. So bear with me a minute while I explain to you my setup and what I think that I'm going to do to get the most accurate job on these. Uh, because I don't have a dedicated brake machine, all I'm using is a standard engine lathe. Um, I don't have all of the tooling that you would normally see in a brake shop to set up things like this. So what I could do is just hold the end of this in a four jaw, dial in, running off the old surface here. But I don't think that that's going to give me the most accurate job because this could be warped or, or whatever so what i believe that i'm going to do because there is a small chamfer on this side on the bearing race and on the other side i think if i uh, put a setup in my lathe where i can hold this between centers using the spindle bore of this uh, rotor as a reference i think that's going to give me the probably the most accurate uh, accurate job because if i try to dial in off of this. It could be warped. It's all rusty and crusty. I think my best bet is to reference off of the machine work that was done in the spindle board of this, uh, this thing. At least that's my thoughts anyway. So I've got a large piece of industrial shafting here and all I'm going to do is hold this in the three jaw and then use the compound of the lathe to turn a 60 degree taper on the end of this that'll fit in the back of that brake rotor. And because I'm turning it in the lathe with, and not going to pull it back out, It'll be extremely accurate. It's a great way to, to make just a temporary center if you're, if you're wanting to turn between centers and you don't have one that slides up into the, uh, the headstock of your lathe. You can just spin one out. Spin it out. It'll be as accurate as it can be because as long as you don't take it out of the chuck, it's, it's just a great way to hold things in between centers, especially on you know temporary setups or just a few run parts anyway. our center. That's all we need. Just enough taper to where it mates up with the 
taper that's on the actual part that we're machining. And then there's our large bull nose for the other end. So let's see if we can't get this rotor in between centers and then we'll go uh, grind a tool to machine the rotor. All right, that's good. Now, now, push. Push. Okay, there you go. That may be too much. There you go. Let's see. No, it's too much. No? Sure? Yeah, it's too much. Back up, screw that out. In. Yeah, now back it up. It's... All right, now. Now you go push ahead. it forward? No, just lock the handle, that big handle. Pull that around. Now, just crank that in. So wiggly. <laughs> It'll center. There you go. That's good. I got it for now. Thank you. I appreciate the help. I just couldn't do that without bumping everything around by myself. So I just got done digging through my high-speed steel drawer, and I found this previously used piece of 5 8 Momax. It's a Super Momax Cobalt, and I'm hoping that this good quality high-speed steel will hold up to this abrasive uh, cast iron. It's just got a lot of rust and stuff on it. It's going to be really rough on a cutting edge, so I'm hoping that this will uh, do the trick for us. Also want to keep this piece as, as big as possible so it wicks heat away from the cutting edge because we're not going to be using coolant, and I'm going to put as little relief behind the cutting edge as, you know, as possible to get the job done. That way we have a well-supported edge. So let's go over to the grinder. We'll talk about the profile that we're going to use. And then uh, we'll come back over here and hopefully knock this out. What do you want? What is it? What do you want? Hmm? You want to go outside? Go outside? Okay. I'll let you out. Come on. So a mistake that I made and I see a lot of people make when they first start grinding their own tooling is they'll put way too much relief behind the cutting edge. Now it's obviously better to have a little more relief than too little because too little you'll, you'll just rub. But any excess relief that's more than it's needed to get the job done, all that does is weaken the cutting edge. And we, we want to avoid that and keep the tool as strong as possible. That way we're not back and forth uh, to the grinder a million times. So what I'm going to do on this tool is put probably a quarter inch radius, just a really long cutting edge. That way if I do get dull, I can just cant the tool post a little bit and, and continue on cutting. I'm also going to put a couple degrees of rake in this thing. So just minimal, minimal clearance, just a big robust cutting edge. That's all I, all I want out of this. I think that's, that's good enough at the grinder anyway. I'll finish this up, just address this edge a bit at the uh, bench with some stones, and we'll go try it out. So if you want to... Gotta let Cora in. Come on in, little girl, come on in. Join us again. So if you want to check for relief and you got a surface plate or a piece of glass, whatever, a square, or anything really, you can... Uh, just set it on there. 
Cora, are you trying to help? Set it on there, and as long as you have light, your, as long as your cutting edge is the first thing that's touching the square, you're good. you got uh, clearance all the way around wherever you plan to cut. You should be good. we got more than enough in this. So that should work. So I've got the tool and the lathe here. Here's a problem that I didn't forecast, and that is clearance is a big issue here. It took me about 10 minutes to get this tool in a position to where I can travel across this entire surface without the compound hitting the, uh, the end of the, of, the, of the rotor here because it's all one piece, it doesn't come apart, and it's pretty large actually for this lathe. Um, it's just one of those things that uh, you run into when you're machining. Sometimes getting enough clearance to get the cutter to move where it needs to is a lot of work and can take half the time of the entire job. Uh, so, I've got it set up to where I can cut this side, but the, another issue is that the uh, cross slide here can't move under this rotor. It's just too large for, for me to have to move under there. So I'm going to have to, once I cut this side, I'll have to flip this rotor around and, uh, and cut the other end. Or take it out, maybe move the carriage all the way down and then put it back in. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. We'll have to see. I know I can cut this one side. All I want to do is dust it. So let's see if we can do that. And then we'll try to get the other side. How about that? All right, so it would help if I hit record, but you didn't miss anything. Just barely touching across the face of this thing. I'm power feeding in, running 17 RPM. I uh, don't want to take too big a cut because all that's driving this is the friction between the, the, the uh, driver or the center that I cut. You know, between these two, so just light cuts, taking it easy. So check that out. Finish was super nice, actually. Finally cleaned up. It took forever because I'm assuming that where this thing set for a decade plus, 2003 is the last time it was licensed, in a field, getting rained on and stuff, and where the pad was, it looked like it maybe it had corrosion. It was an area about the size of the pad that took forever to clean up. I guess some water got between there and just ate the rotor more than where it would air dry elsewhere. I don't know. But uh, the minimum thickness on this is what looks to be point or 1.4, uh, either 6 or 8, 5. It's hard to tell. And we are already below that, and I haven't even cleaned up the other side. 0.1447. So, unfortunately, this thing is out of spec, and uh, Johnny Cash is going to have to have a uh, brake rotor at least on the passenger side, but this will get us on the road. Um, you know, we'll be able to test drive and stuff, but eventually we're going to have to replace this guy. It's going to be too, it's already past its minimum thickness. So we'll see. You know, we'll run this thing, see how it does. Maybe, knowing me, we'll run it for a long time, but really, 
uh, she's gonna have to get a, a rotor for the for the passenger side. We are gonna have to get one. So. Crank that handle. This one? Yeah, no, that one. Up in the end. How far? Keep going. Alright, that's good. So now it's time to, to dress the other side. That, uh, that tool held up on that first side, no problem at all, which is a good thing. So when I was growing up, my dad ran a repair business out of uh, the shop that we had at our house. And he would do engine rebuilds, he would do transmission rebuilds, he would do brake jobs, just general maintenance and repair. He was a pretty much all-around type of guy. But I can still remember the sound of the brake drum machine that he, he still has, brake rotor machine. I think it was made by Bear. The sound of it getting out of round rotors back into round I can still hear it through from the kitchen of the house that I grew up in that sound of those brake rotors turning um, and it brings back a lot of memories the sound of a brake rotor turning I, I don't know it's, it doesn't mean nothing to most people but to me you know it, it brings back a lot of fond memories as a kid watching my dad tree these things up in our shop at home All right, so you get the idea. Finished on both sides. I am very happy, actually, with the finish. Didn't get harmonic or anything. The cutter held up really good through the through the whole thing or both sides. Uh, Set up, it worked. Although the size of this and just the shape of the lathe kind of made it a hassle to get to both sides, but it did work, and that's really all that matters. So our final thickness, 1.428, uh, 1.4. 6.5 or 8.5, I can't tell, is the recommended minimum thickness on this thing. So it was it was past that anyway. So really, this will just get us to where we can put it on there. We can test drive the vehicle, you know. But when it comes time to do brakes, this thing's going to have to be uh, replaced. But you get the idea. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. This worked less than ideal, but it did give me the desired outcome, which is a nice parallel, two nice parallel surfaces with a good finish on both sides that are not all rust pitted uh, to death. So there we go. I am happy with the way that that worked out, even though it was a bit of a struggle uh, to get it done.
So when tightening up wheel bearings, I like to just snug them down good, make sure that they're seated. I know the, I never pulled the races out of this, uh, this spindle or this hub, so I know that they're seated good. So I'm just gonna crank that down to its, I know it's good and seated. And then I'm gonna back it up. Just to uh, feel it start to let off pressure. And that's it. Just not to where it completely lets off, but just to where it's just snug in the bearings into the races. That's the way I like to do them. You know, you drive them down the road, check the temperature of them. You know, better to have them just a hair on the loose side than too tight. They'll burn up if they're too tight. But they'll just be loose if they're loose. They'll burn up at least too, but you get the idea. So let's do a quick update video on the Brown & Sharp 618 MicroMaster surface grinder that was picked up at auction a, a few weeks back. Um, now, I showed the unloading of this, getting this thing in the shop. I showed a video where we just did a brief overview of this machine. We pulled the front cover, cleaned out the oil sump because it basically had no oil. <laughs> it had some oil and water in it, but very little due to uh, uh, the rigging company. You know, and this thing uh, being moved from the working shop that it was in. And I knew nothing about this machine. I did not know if it actually worked or anything about it. So in, in a past video, we did run the spindle. We moved it through all its, all its movements and it seemed to function. Well, I found out a few more things about this. I was having trouble with the magnetic chuck as well. So let me show you some of the new things that I've found. Give you a little update on this thing. So if you guys watched the video where we were going over this machine, just doing a, a function test on this thing, making sure that it you know, did what it was supposed to do. And everything, at least as far as I was concerned, was at a minimum just working except for the mag chuck. I was having some problems with that. And uh, I, just to bring everybody up to speed, I was poking around. On the front of this, it says voltage 110 or 115, me never having messed with one of these electromagnetic chucks before, I just assumed it doesn't specify AC or DC. I just assumed that it was AC voltage. So a lot of you guys may remember that I just took the wire to bypass the circuitry because it was not working with this drum switch that I suspected to be bad. I took the wire that directly runs out of the chuck, bypassed all that, put a 110 volt plug on it, plugged it into a known power source, an extension cord that was actually had power to it, it still didn't work. So I assumed that this chuck was bad. Luckily, I have a lot of really bright viewers out there who pointed out to me that this chuck is most likely not AC voltage, it is DC voltage. And now that I think about that, that makes far more sense for electro electromagnet. So I immediately come back out in the shop after I posted that video and, and got those comments and started poking around on this machine. And I rewired it exactly the way that it was when it showed up because I assumed that it was wired up correctly. Um, so rewired it exactly the way that it was, turned the power on to this thing, and it still didn't work. So I was like, well, heck, it's got problems elsewhere. So I got to digging around in the electronics enclosure on this thing and found that on the four bridge rectifier, or on the step down transformer, there is a four bridge rectifier that had a bunch of crimp connectors on it that some of them were really loose. So I recrimped all those connectors, powered this thing up, and lo and behold, it functioned, which was a big relief to me. Um, having never serviced one, I've used these in the past on machines, but personally, I've never had to service one. They almost just always do what they're supposed to do. There's not a lot to go wrong in an electromagnet. But thankfully, it does work. I started just dusting the top of this thing, um, unsuccessfully, I'll add, uh, with this thing just running it through its paces, and uh, thankfully it does work. Let me show you this chuck functioning. I'll show you how out of flat it is and how rough the top of this chuck is, and we'll, we'll talk about this machine a little more, tell you what I know about it at this point. So I've got a pretty thick uh, washer here. 
I'm gonna set it on there. And you can see chuck's not on, although it does have quite a bit of just residual magnetism in the chuck, especially right in the middle there. Kind of varies uh, or lightens up uh, there on the ends, but right there in the middle, got quite a bit of magnetism. But you can see I can move that around quite easy. But now I'm gonna go ahead and turn that magnet on. And it is crazy strong. What I like about a manual chuck is that you can kind of just quickly vary the magnetism. I guess you could you could do that with one of these if you could vary the voltage. But uh, right now, the way that this thing's set up, it's either 100% on or, or off. Uh, you get the idea. But it does work, and I am very thankful for that because uh, I didn't want to have to replace this thing. Now, let me show you the wear that's on the top of this chuck. This thing was used for a very, very long time. I can tell you about how much wear is on it. Uh, just to do rough work, probably years uh, without being resurfaced. I need to get this machine off of the pallet, set on the floor. I need to get it full of oil. I need to get coolant on this thing to where I can properly grind in this chuck and evaluate this machine. I've really just been messing around with it uh, at the moment. But look how rough. You can see where this was touching, where the wheel was grinding. You know, and that's after multiple passes. You can see really worn right where you would think, right in the middle. Uh, you know, it's not worn so much out on the ends where people don't use the chuck as much. So pretty substantial wear. I'm, I'm guessing it's a couple thousandths at least low. Got a couple places where somebody's, you know, dropped the wheel down into the chuck a bit. But uh, at least it works. Let's dress this wheel a bit, dust over this thing. I'll show you, show you it working, because it does, thankfully. And, uh, and, you know, we'll talk a little more about the machine. So you can see that this thing is a little jerky. I'm not exactly for sure what's causing that. Uh, I don't know if this is the handle's not disengaging exactly the way that it should, causing this thing to load up for a second. Because you can you can see kind of that it kicks in right there where it starts jerking. So I think it's got a little bit of valving issue in here. Just not 100% for sure. It could be that where I've only got five gallons of oil in this thing that it just got a lot of air in it. Don't know. So I really need to get this thing off of the pallet, get it on the ground, get it completely full of oil, uh, get some coolant on it, and do a really uh, thorough grind of the chuck. That way I can evaluate whether this thing, you know, it's got a bunch of wear in it or not. All right, so fast forward at least an hour. I've probably went over this chuck 20 times, just trying to remove as much material as I can uh, for the time when I go to really try to surface this truck. I'm just, truck, I got truck on the brain, chuck, because it was so worn, you know, I just kind of blasted over this thing as slow and as fast as I can, if that makes sense, and not completely burn this thing up. I do have a few little spots where, you know, the wheel was filling up and and uh, and starting to streak, and I just said, okay, that's enough, because I believe that the spindle on this thing is good. It leaves a great finish wherever you try, um, and I think this machine needs to get off of this pallet. It needs to be filled up with fluid, it needs to have a temporary coolant system put on it, and it really it really needs uh, this chuck ground in and then a set of test blocks ground on it. Uh, the spindle, I think, is fine, like I said. Uh, the chuck works. 
It does move, although I believe it has either a valving issue in the hydraulics, maybe an O-ring or something's out of adjustment. I, could be air in the system where this thing's not full, causing the table to jerk around a bit because it moves, I mean, as smooth as it can move by hand. But under hydraulic uh, uh, power, this is not disengaging properly. Not exactly for sure. I'll have to look at the hydraulic circuit and investigate that a bit. But at least I think that this machine is worth diving in deeper and uh, filling up with with uh, filling up with oil and you know giving it the full hardcore test and then tear into it and see you know what the deal is. So I've got a modification that I want to share with you that I'm going to be doing to my Cincinnati 24 inch metal shaper. Now I've wanted to do this for a long time. I've just decided I've had enough. Now, the problem with this machine, or the perceived problem, is that it doesn't seem to be getting enough oil to the box section of this machine. It has an automatic oiling system. In the base, there's an oil pump. It pumps oil up to this tower, and then it gravity feeds through a bunch of tubes down to the rest of the components on this machine. It does oil the ram. It seems to oil that plenty. It does oil this big pivot arm in here. I'm happy with the way that the main casting gets oiled. I, what I'm not happy with is the way that the box, the ways, the column, whatever, the lead screw, I've just never been happy with the amount of oil that this thing supplies to automatically to those to those places. I've cleaned out all the lines, I've done tests, I've just, it's just never been enough to make me happy. So I always resorted to an oil can, hitting all the spots that I can, and some of them I cannot uh, hit with an oil can, and I'm just hoping that they're getting enough. So let me show you what I plan to do. I am gonna leave this section automatic, and I'm gonna make this section a manual oil section. Let me bring you in, I'll show you what I plan to do. So I believe this machine here is one of the last year models that uh, Cincinnati had a gravity feed oil system. They eventually went to a pressurized oil system and they went to a, an electronic clutch. This is manual clutch, gravity feed oil system. So the heart of the machine gets oiled first, then it comes down, it comes out of this, out of the main casting into this hose. Oil is supplied to a little manifold here that hooks to a bunch of tubes, and those tubes run to all of the components, the lead screw, all of the machine surfaces, the, the nuts on the end of the lead screw on both sides. It goes to quite a few places uh, on the box section of this. And uh, what I plan to do is to just cap off the supply from the machine and put a pump oiler uh, in, in this line. That's kind of the idea. Uh, that way I can control how much oil this thing gets. I can hit it, you know, and uh, and it'll be good. That's what I'm hoping. All right, so let's see if we can't pull this line off. Cora, are you trying to help? Yeah, I know. Mm, bend down. She thinks you're going to get it better. Okay. So we'll pull that off. Got a quick coupling there. does have oil in it. And then we got to pull off this elbow here and cap this end of the uh, of the supply. Watch out, little girl. You're getting oil all over everything. Ugh. These are by far my favorite pliers. These are the Nipex Cobra. I've got a set of three of these. Quick to adjust. They got really sharp jaws on them. Very, very nice. Great for stuff like this. So that's just eighth inch NPT that comes out of there. Show you the oiler. So there's a look at the pump oiler that I'm going to use. Now I need to transfer. It's capable of oiling from either the right or the left, and I'm going to remove this plug. 
that we've got over here on the left and move it over here to the right. Um, that way I can use this port over here and cap off uh, this one here. So I have to position this in a way to where I get full travel on the, on the knee, whatever you want to call it, the box, and I want to be able to open this door without it hitting. So well, that's about the only place it can be, actually, uh, which is fine, I guess, as long as I've got enough. We're pretty close to the same position that it was just originally. So I'm going to hook this up. I'll mark these holes. I'll put some oil in this, test it before I 100% commit. But I think this is going to work. And I, and I definitely like this better than just hoping that it's doing its thing. Yeah, that's working. You can, you can physically feel it pumping oil in there. So that's good. I'll just have to mount this now and just keep an eye on it and make sure you know, it's doing what it should be. But let's see if we can't get this marked out and, uh, and get this mounted. drill bit is dull. Try that. Oh, yeah. That's nice. So these extended tap handles are really nice. But I didn't have any in the smaller size like this. But I did have several of this, these cheap little general I think is the name brand and all I did was I cut it right at the at the lip there cut it took a piece of half inch stainless tubing because it's what I had put it just TIG welded to it together and now it looks I mean <laughs> matches even so that's a little project if you want to make you some extended tab handle wrenches out of your really short ones they're very handy These Pika deep hole markers are, are awesome. They're expensive, they're overpriced, but they work really good for stuff like this, marking holes. That's kind of what they're made for. Hey. Let go, you gotta let go. If you want me to throw it, you gotta let go. Let go. You did it, little girl. Can I see it? Yeah, I like it.
So I want to take just a second and touch on a very, very valuable tool to me in the shop, and that is this Storm LGR Extreme made by Allure. It's a shop dehumidifier, or it's just a dehumidifier in general. It's not made for shops. But I've been using this, I'm guessing, going on a year and a half or two years. It's got almost 6,000 hours on it. It's been 100% trouble-free. And to be honest, it's been one of the best additions tool-wise to this shop that I've done. Keeps it cooler in here, although you may not think a dehumidifier would make, make it cooler. It actually, in our area, is very humid at times, and this thing, it can be blazing hot outside, and it feels like it's air-conditioned in here, even if it's the same temperature, just of a lower humidity. And not only does it help with the way that it feels in the shop, but it also keeps all my stuff from rusting. It's really an awesome tool to have for anybody who has a shop that is any bit decently sealed up. It makes a huge difference. Not affiliated with these guys. I didn't get a discount on it. Didn't, none of that stuff. Just a great tool that I, every time I turn it on or off, I just appreciate the fact that I invested in it. And, you know, it's just been great. So there you go. Get you a shop dehumidifier if you want to, try to keep your stuff in better condition than what it would be otherwise it has made just a night and day difference in my shop so Cora loves it because it makes it feel a lot cooler in here when it's hot don't don't it girl everybody that comes in here is like well you got an air conditioner in here nope just dehumidified okay so oiler installed. I've been messing with it for a few minutes, pumped it, checked where the oil's coming out at. I'm very, very happy that I've done that. In fact, I've been wanting to do that exact swap or change, modification, whatever you want to call it, for over a year. I've just never got around to it. I've always had other things going on, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do that today. So, got that done. I was hoping to get into another project that I had planned, but we're out of time in this video. It's already gotten way too long. So, that is it. Thanks for watching. Huge thanks to the guys who made some comments who led me to the solution to that mag chuck working on one of my previous videos. Appreciate you guys more than you know. So that is it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.